Hi, Gene Montrostelli here, the editor of TappingQA.com. The video that you are about to watch is a conversation that was a part of this year's 24 Hours of Tapping. The 24 Hours of Tapping is a fundraiser for the amazing work that is done by the Peaceful Heart Network. The Peaceful Heart Network has brought tapping to migrants, refugees, prisoners, and the underprivileged in over 30 countries all over the world. As you watch this video, if you learned something, if you were touched by it, if you were inspired by it, the easiest way to say thank you is to support the work of the Peaceful Heart Network. To do that, all you need to do is go to 24hoursoftapping.com slash support. And as you look in the description and the first comment down below, you will see a direct link to that. I hope you enjoy this conversation. Our next conversation is with my friend, Nancy Forrester. Nancy is a clinical psychologist who is a clinical psychotherapist who is retired. She's a coach. She's an international speaker. She's an award-winning entrepreneur and adult educator. Her own experience of overwhelming loss 30 years ago led her to the deep study of how stuck energy of unprocessed, unprocessed trauma continues to be expressed in the biology of the nervous system today, limiting a person's capacity, leading to joy, health, and a prosperous life. Here is an awesome opportunity for us to see how we can energize our relationships with ourselves, with others, by using a little tapping. One of the questions I've been asking lots and lots of folks over the course of the day is, you know, we asked folks like you when you're joining us, what do you want to talk about? And so you'd sent forward, you know, this idea about relationships. Why is that something that's kind of at the, the front of your brain, your experience right now in your work, in your personal life? Like, how do we land here today? Oh, we have landed here because I have spent 45 years really looking at what are the fundamental principles of being in a relationship which is healthy, which is supportive to everybody in that relationship. And uh, we're here because what I know to be true is that relationships are fundamental to absolutely everything, mm -hmm. right? We are created in relationship, we're wounded in relationship, we heal in relationship, we are in relationship with absolutely everything, whether it can be as insignificant as my relationship with my clothes dryer in the basement, mm -hmm. or as significant as my relationship with my intimate uh, lifelong partner, that uh, we can look at how ourselves in relationship with what is, is the fundamental core uh, nugget of how we are going to transform from where we are in this moment into the potential of who we are created to be originally anyways. And, and one of the things that I like about that, and, and this is something that's been at the front of kind of my personal work, um, as well as just the work I've been doing with clients is more and more recognizing the fact that everything exists inside of a context. And and, and like and like at a very base level, when most of us are learning the 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 basics of tapping, we learn about aspects. You know, what happens if I'm doing this thing? What happens if I'm doing this thing with my boss inside of my room in the room? What happens if I'm doing this thing? What happens if I'm doing this thing in a low resource state? Like we're we're cut, we're starting to think about that, but I think so often just because we're trying to understand what's going on is we're like thinking of ourselves inside of a vacuum. Um yeah. and, and, it, and it's almost as if like when we're doing work so often, we think about it like a high school physics problem. All high school physics problems are done at sea level in a vacuum on a frictionless plane because we're trying to learn the basics of the physics. And so they want to take out all of these externalities to make it simpler for us to understand what's going on. And I think yeah. so often in transformation, we forget about the context and the relationship and the baggage or not the baggage, the history and the information that comes with that particular relationship as we're kind of navigating our day as we move through the world. Yes, yes, agreed. And having taught high school physics <laughs> for multiple years, I completely relate to what you're saying. And the thing I would add to that is, and Jean, I know you and I have talked about this a bit before, is this understanding that um, uh, EFT tapping is so helpful as a stress management tool. Mm -hmm. Great. Awesome. Right. It gives us a really practical, simple way in the moment to shift the state of our nervous system. And that's great. 
And there's so much more, as they say on the infomercials, right? There's so right. much more. And that's this capacity that is within all of us to actually uh, become more capable of uh, expansion and growth and evolution and this movement into possibilities that uh, just are, are sitting right there for us. And so it's different than using EFT tapping as stress management, using EFT tapping as a transformational technique within this whole understanding of our human biology. And, and that's yes. so exciting. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and what you're talking about, like the vocabulary I use in that is I think of tapping as a tool that has multiple applications. There is the application of emotional first aid, which is exactly what you're talking about. There's the application of dealing with physical pain, a substance sensitivity, clearing a past trauma, clearing a limiting belief, like all of those sorts of things. And I think it's good and useful for us to like, like recognize when I sit down to tap, having a sense of, what is the type of application that I'm doing right now is going to make a difference in my entry point, how I evaluate success, helping me to stay on track as I engage with all of those things as we're stepping into something like this. Yeah. And the piece that I want to add to that in the work that I've been privileged to do over the past, particularly past 10 years, mm -hmm. is really understanding that uh, how our past experiences and how we were held within a container of, I'll just call it love, how we were held within a container of love is really predictive of our capacity to hold ourselves as a safe person in relationship with us. Mm -hmm. And therefore also is predictive of our capacity to bring um, a love-based relationship to those we care about. Yeah. and. And it's so important to recognize that our, as you know, my my work is about helping uh, therapists, coaches, mm -hmm. people who want to become same to learn how to be a safe and effective practitioner. Uh, so it's really about becoming, uh, understanding how to assess the current capacity of a client's nervous system and therefore to know what EFT tapping interventions are going to be useful for them in this moment. There are so many powerful EFT interventions, but so many of them are not appropriate for clients until they reach a stage of transformation. Right. And in fact, using them can actually be harmful to that nervous system and actually uh, throw it back into a more uh, defensive, reactive position. So yeah. yeah. So then, what does that? Yeah, what does that then look like explicitly as we think about this in terms of relationship and kind of entering into that? Yeah, well, let's, could we do that first slide? Just, um, yeah, let me pull them up here real quick. Beautiful. Some of our listeners may be uh, familiar with this uh, biological piece to us as human beings. Uh, others may not. So I'm just going to kind of quickly go through it. Uh, this is all based on Dr. Stephen Porges's polyvagal theory, pretty recent uh, stuff. But this um, uh, concepts to help us recognize that not only are we energetic beings right, at our core uh, and relational beings, but we're also biological beings that were created first and foremost to uh, be safe in this world, to survive. Right. And, and that the biology has only two imperatives, that either it is safe and has the capacity to grow and expand into that's its second imperative, or it's not safe, in which case all of its resources are going to be directed towards creating safety. And that right. becomes incredibly important when we start looking at relationship with ourselves and relationship with others, is what is that current imperative that that nervous system is in right now? So that if the system is threatened, if it's not in a safe place, uh, it is going to, as I say, seek out safety at all costs, the costs of love, the costs of joy, the costs of uh, all of those uh, wonderful experiences we want to have. It's going to be looking for safety uh, and that, uh, that we need to recognize and uh, address with our EFT interventions. So here in this slide, just a, a 
a quick little explanation of that. At the top, we've got what Porges this calls this the social engagement system, and this uh, this is where we feel healthiest, happiest, most connected. We feel all the uh, you know the calm, the confidence, the connection, the curiosity, all of those wonderful states of being that we're in a sense are all seeking for, uh, and there's safety in that social engagement system. Great. So that is the nervous system state, which is going to allow change and allow growth. However, if there is any perception of danger at all, any threat to safety at all, we are designed, right, created in the factory to move into defense mode, which we know first level is fight and flight, right, sympathetic overactivation. And so we become protective and territorial and we try to, to make groups and allies and them against us and all of that, uh, those strategies in fight or flight. And then if the danger becomes real survival based, we'll go into that blue section, the dorsal uh, area, which is the real shutdown and the freeze, which is uh, protection against death you know, that hopelessness, the helplessness, the uh, victimization sense of there's nothing I can do about this and I might as well just, you know, curl up into a ball and, and, and protect myself. And so all of these nervous system states happen in relationship with ourselves as well as in relationship with others. And what, uh, uh, what I think EFT tapping is so good at is helping us shift these nervous system states quickly uh, in the moment in order to uh, change our relationship with what is. Uh, so I think maybe, Jean, the next slide with this might be a good time to uh, kind of go to that. So if I superimpose then in the middle of my diagram here, uh, what's often called the emotional vibrational chart, uh, different sources for that. Probably David Hawkins is the most familiar in his Power Versus Force uh, book. Uh, and this is saying that different nervous system states have different frequencies, different energies uh, associated with different uh, vibrations of emotion. So down at the bottom of the emotional vibrational chart, there we're going to have our, you know, the shame, the guilt, the helplessness, hopelessness moving up uh, into the middle, more of the irritation, the rage, the panic, the terror. And then at the top, uh, the sort of love spectrum of connection and understanding, tolerance, openness, uh, all of those things. But the point that I want to make, which I think is on the, uh, let's stay just here for a sec. The point that I want to make is that line that I drew on the emotional vibrational chart, that's neutral. And neutral is what is. Like what the, the world is not personal to us over 8 billion years of evolution, right? The world is not personal to us. The challenge, of course, and maybe this uh, this should take us to the next slide. The challenge is that we take the world personally. And so we then either create a reactive relationship with the world, characterized by the bottom of the vibrational chart and the threat responses, or we have the capacity to create a responsive relationship to life. And so then uh, building on what you said earlier about aspects, if we look at a relationship to life, relationship to what is, I put what is, that's the WI in the little bobble there at neutral, and we're in relationship with what is, which means we will have over on the right hand side, we will have thoughts, we will have beliefs, we will have conclusions, generalizations, all of that mind channel uh, uh, experiences. As well on the left, we will have more body based, we'll have emotions, we'll have sensations, we'll have imagery, all showing up in reaction to what is. And then finally in the middle at the bottom, based on that reactive uh, thinking, that reactive emotions, sensations, we will come up with behaviors in the world to manage that experience. And those behaviors uh, I call reactive behaviors. And, uh, and, and that then is a, all of this together uh, is, is suffering right? Is that sort of um, what Resma Menachem calls in his beautiful book, My Grandmother's Hands, he calls it dirty pain, right? Because it's it's coming from these 
uh, thoughts and and uh, the sort of like clouds of the past uh, coming and overshadowing the context of uh, the neutrality of what is today. And I think one of the things that's really important in what you're saying there, Nancy, is that is like like to to distill it down to one word is like interpret it's like it's an interpretation, and the the subconscious mind operates as if it understands the world accurately yes and yeah. our emotional responses are not to how the world is but how we are interpreting the world through our lived experience yeah. through the cultural stories that are given to us mm -hmm. that then shade what's going on but because they are so cultural stories because they are lived experience we just assume that they're proportionate and they're well informed yes. and this idea of you know getting back to what is like for me like the goal is a proportionate well-informed emotional response yeah. and so much of what you're talking about here is is it proportionate and is it well informed do i un really actually understand what this lived experience is accurately because i am my emotional state is coming out of my interpretation of it not what is actually happening Yes, and, and uh, uh, I really like what you're saying because uh, we can often tell uh, that. Is this uh, response, is, is, is what I'm thinking, perceiving, is it based in current reality today? Mm -hmm. Or is it coming from some sort of deficit from the past, uh, which is as yet unhealed and is clouding over this capacity to be present here and now with clarity around how we choose to perceive uh, what is in this moment. And that's very often the, the way that we can tell. Like people say to me, well, Nancy, how do you know whether this is a cloud from the past overshadowing or whether I'm in this, uh, this clear relationship with today? And, and I say it's, it's around intensity. If it feels hmm. really, really intense, that's going to be a clue to this is coming from something uh, from the past, which is uh, creating a vulnerability uh, for us today. Yep. Yeah, cool. Um, so then if we I think if we go to the next slide here. So as I look at uh, the the work and the transformational work, then what we're actually wanting to do is build this capacity to flip the pyramid mm -hmm. what is is what is what is is going to stay the same it's going to stay neutral our job is not to change what is that is you know way above our pay grade but what is within our capacity is this flipping of the energy of the reactive pyramid up to a responsive uh, pyramid. And that's then shifting from a threat response, sympathetic dorsal, into a more social engagement responsivity to what is. And uh, as you say, that is where we have the capacity for the clarity to, re to respond to life as it is today and whatever action may need to occur based on the reality of the context uh, today. So this is this is why I you know how many years later that I've been doing EFT thirty or something I am I am as enamored if not more so enamored with the EFT tapping today because of its capacity to actually facilitate this rotation this flip of of the pyramid and and one of the things that that's showing up inside of this and this is something I think about a lot like most people when they are introduced to tapping they are introduced to a sud scale which is the subjective unit of distress where yeah. the goal is to get something to a zero or low enough that I can manage what's going on for me like what you're talking about here is a SU scale, which is the subjective unit of experience. Yeah. And oftentimes when we're doing a SU scale, it's going from a negative 10 to a positive 10, because like you're saying here, it's not just about eliminating the negative, but what's the state that I want to be in? It's not that I'm no longer afraid to speak up at work, but I'm speaking up at work in an empowered way, in a grounded way, in a confident way. Like it could be any and all of those things. And so when we're flipping this, this, this triangle, this pyramid, like you're talking about here, it's not just about reducing, but it's yeah. like, what's the state that I want to be instead? And I think the other thing as we're looking at this is like, Conceptually, we can look at this and I'm like, I'm down here and I want to be there. Sometimes when we're in pain, we can't actually see where we want to go to. Like, Absolutely. it's also okay to go, my first step is to leave distress. But as I leave distress, 
I start to go, oh, this is the thing that's possible. And so I love seeding this right now. So as people are feeling better, they might not be able to see the other end of it right now, but as they're feeling better to open their eyes to go, not only do we want to reduce, but as it reduces, give yourself permission to be open to what the alternative is as we navigate through this. What do you want instead that is better? Yes. And that's called neuroplasticity. Yeah. That that understanding that we now have that we can change the way the brain nervous system is structured and how it functions that we can invite and support we can create the conditions under which a nervous system will prune off these old limiting beliefs previous experiences etc 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 and replace, install with um, what I might call capital T truth, the mm -hmm. authenticness of who we actually are created to be. And what, uh, what I get so excited about is, first of all, that that's that in my lifetime, that has become possible. Right. Well, I mean, the, the fact that, yeah, that, that that is a discovery that is new inside of our lifetimes. Like, you know, I can remember growing up and being taught, like, you have this many brain cells and the brain is stuck. And like, this is what the brain is. Boy, you better not hurt it because nothing ever changes inside of that. It can only diminish. And the fact that we now have recognized that that's not true. And, you know, speaking of like a little personal moment here uh, is uh, I had uh, recently had my 70th birthday. And previous birthdays have not been a big deal to me. It's like, nah, 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 nah. just don't even think about it. 70 hit like a ton of bricks. Mm -hmm. It's like the societal conditioning in my brain around aging. Wow. And, and so it's personal to me, this realization that I don't have to live out those beliefs that I can mm -hmm. actually do the uh, put the effort in and the attention and the focus and shift those into the beliefs that I know are actually available and possible uh, for me. Uh, yeah. And, yeah, and that is so exciting. Uh, and then the other thing I really want to say here is it's not an all or nothing kind of thing. Right. As we start this rotation again as we as practitioners we create the conditions under which this bottom pyramid is going to start rotating start its flipping motion there will be little moments of social engagement show up so we're not going to like tap 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 and then all of a sudden it's going to be flipped and now we're going to install right. the new thoughts and beliefs. And this is what has really, really transformed my work is this recognition that the, uh, the sun is always shining, the possibilities are always there, that if we can't, we'll pay attention closely enough to that nervous system, and watch it for how it's communicating to us in this moment, it will show us these little sparks, these little moments of greater organization and uh and if we can support those then that will actually support this the entire flip of this uh, pyramid but we don't want to wait uh, like we'll be uh prolonging <laughs> prolonging the suffering uh, and so we see these little moments that are indicating that that nervous system has found enough safety that is now entertaining the possibility of change mm -hmm. yep. yeah cool so from this uh, uh, graph, what I really want to point out is on this bottom pyramid, the, the fear-based, threat-based uh, pyramid, these are our vulnerabilities, right? These are the places where we have a, a potential for love that hasn't quite been realized yet. Uh, and so that is going to be in, in the thoughts and also in the emotion sensations and so on. These potentials for love that hasn't been realized. And then the behaviors are going to be protective nature behaviors in order to uh, protect from the intensity of that vulnerability. Does that make sense how I'm saying yep. it? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Right? Because it's really, really tough to be vulnerable. I mean, those yep. early hurts and wounds, excruciating to be able to face them and bring them into uh, the moment in time today. So we have way, all kinds of ways that we protect ourselves uh, from acknowledging those, those vulnerabilities. 
So then let's have maybe, oh, I think, uh, could we take a moment and just, I have a couple of suggestions for people who, uh, to start doing some work around this for themselves. I'd love to hear your thoughts about these as we go. So number, number one is I can't underestimate the need for a daily routine, a daily ritual, something consistent that we are doing on a, a daily basis. Otherwise, we get so stuck, it becomes more difficult to actually get ourselves out of that, uh, that bottom based uh, triangle. So and, and, and when you say when you say daily routine, Nancy, like, I think that I think something that I found that it's really good for us to make explicit here is daily routine doesn't have to be long doesn't have to be complicated. My daily routine is I do seven to 10 minutes of wordless tapping every single morning. Yeah. Where, where it literally is just I set the timer and it's the old yellow pages ad. I let my fingers do the walking and I don't like and I don't engage with it any other way because it's the beginning of the day. I'm trying to set up. I'm trying to change my resource state, whatever. And recently I had because I was coming back from some sickness and struggling, I had gotten out of the habit. And within me doing that four days, like every single day was better. Like it like it was just like that scale that you're talking about, like my base of that scale moved up from something as simple as that. And so like, don't think daily routine, I have to do the personal piece procedure, or I have to find a 15 minute tap along or whatever. Daily routine is just that something simple, something small, you know, doesn't have to be much more complicated than brushing your teeth. Uh, well, and and I on occasion that is exactly when I do my tapping. Yeah. Uh, yeah. My morning routine is I love that first cup of coffee and I love me a good trashy novel. Now mm -hmm. I, these are not like smut novels; these are like uh, psychological kind of twister right. thriller type things. But I love that first like half hour, forty five minutes of the day where I've got the coffee and the novel, and I'm just doing like you're doing, like yep. what we call here bronze tapping, but just mindless tapping on the points as I'm like literally enjoying and feeling the gratitude and appreciation mm -hmm. at this time in my day. Yeah. And then uh, the next thing I do is I actually move into uh, more of kind of, it's a bit of a meditation, but I love to sing by myself. Mm -hmm. nowhere yep. else. I love to sing. And so I have just a repertoire, a very small repertoire of songs, which I will then tap as I sing. And that is, uh, you know, just a beautiful opening to the day. Awesome. The, the second thing I would suggest, if people want to do a little bit more than that, I would uh, suggest what I call uh, holding the truth of the moment. And mm -hmm. that's just using the setup phrase to acknowledge what is true in this moment. So it might just mm -hmm. sound like, you know, we're tapping on the side of the hand and we're saying, even though my nervous system hasn't fully found safety yet, right, I'm willing to support it to do that some version of that, which we can then bring into the, the yeah. uh, protocol, you know, tapping on all the reminder points and so on and so on. And, and, and I always think about when, when we're talking about that, I always think about Milton Erickson and the idea that all transformation starts by stating what is. Yes. And so like me, almost all of my rounds of tapping start with, I recognize the fact. And I'm yeah. just like stating with what do I recognize? And then I start giving my emotional response to that. But it, it's it's really interesting if we just give voice to the lived experience, we transform our relationship from that thing because it's going from something that is implicit to something that is explicit and something that is explicit is easier to evaluate, to understand, to turn around, to process, to do something with. Yeah. And just the, you know, and for me, the reason I go there is like, I don't want to get into love and acceptance until I'm ready to get there. For me, that feels like I'm rushing ahead way too fast. So that's the reason why I don't use the traditional setup phrase, but I recognize the fact very similar to the even though, but it, for me, it's emotionally neutral because I want to be safe when I'm stepping into it before right. we get to what we need to be getting to. Exactly. Right. And that's where this polyvagal nervous system piece comes in, right? If we have a, a client or ourselves who's very much in that dorsal, very, very uh, mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, like it, it, it's in this moment, I am so unsafe that it's just a really difficult place for me. That yeah. person is by no means ready for an EFT setup phrase. Right. Like that is just too much, too soon, too fast to even begin recognizing what is true in this yep. moment for them. So there it's like the the basic tapping on the points and those daily rituals are, are absolutely essential. Yep. Yeah. So, and, and just one other thought there for, uh, for people to begin with is I would take a basic, uh, belief, 
uh, from the uh, from a pyramid that's beginning to rotate. I take a basic belief, which would be maybe uh, uh, it's possible for me to feel safe in this world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, right? which can be super way beyond uh, for some people, but simply to set it up as an affirmation and then do the exposure part of EFT. So state the affirmation and tap the points around maybe even looking in the mirror. I often yep. would write it on an index card and just expose myself to it that way, tapping on the points as I'm repeating that yep. uh, to to support that system. So a couple of ideas of how you know, how we could how yep. we can start. So then excitedly she asks you to move into the next slide where we can look at how does this uh, play out uh, with a relationship between two peoples now relationship between two people is incredibly uh, complex right and so i have like just i have found that this little piece of psychoeducation is really helpful for the for couples who are in intimate relationships that i'm working with uh, or even for any kind of relationship right um uh, whether it's the the uh, barista at my coffee shop or a friend or uh, any kind of relationship. So here we've got two uh, people cleverly called person one and person two. And they are um, they are in a relationship and they are going to have what I call a little rupture in the flow of love in that mm -hmm. relationship. So then if we go to the next slide, we'll see person number one, probably unconsciously, definitely unintentionally, because I'm not talking about relationships where there's a big level of physical, emotional abuse here. We're, we're those, that's a separate uh, uh, context to deal with. But inadvertently, unintentionally, person number one says or, or does something that person number two can observe. So mm -hmm. this is a five sensory kind of, you know, the person turns their head one way or the person says something, there's something observable there. Then on the next slide, we see that the energy of that comes into the field, relational field, and is perceived by person number two as hitting one of their raw buttons, one mm -hmm. of their vulnerability buttons. And that sets off that uh, bottom of the uh, bottom of the, the pyramid at the bottom of the chart. Uh, those thoughts, those beliefs, those hurts, those past wounds, all of that sort of stuff. Again, unconsciously, it's all happening in the more limbic areas of the brain, sets off that reactivity for person number two. So then, of course, on the next slide, person number two is going to protect themselves from that vulnerability. They think it's about the other person, but they're actually coming up with a protection against the intensity of their own vulnerability. And so then they come up with something observable. Perhaps they say something back into the energetic field. Uh, perhaps they uh, leave the room. They do something that person number one can observe. And then next slide, surprise, surprise, that uh, person number two behavior is so cleverly designed to actually trigger the raw wounded place in person number one. And person number one doesn't want to feel that intensity. So they quickly drop down into their response, their reactivity to their own vulnerability. And they either do the same thing they did before or, or they do a different behavior observable by person number two and so on and so on and so on. And this loop, which of course is a biological brain-based uh, neural associative network, the this, this negativity loop gets stronger and stronger and stronger with every repetition. And, and, so and one of the, yeah, one of the things inside of this, Nancy, sometimes, sometimes this happens in a very conscious way. Sometimes. I can remember, I can remember when my, my sister was a teenager and my mother and my sister were having one of those very intense conversations that mothers and daughters have and my mom said you're just saying that to push my buttons and my sister said how can i not they're this big um but most of the time this sort of stuff again is the the software that is implicitly running in the background yes, exactly. because again going back to the idea that we talked about that what we're doing is we're interpreting what is going on because 
you know, all communication is judged in the response. It's not what's said, it's what's understood. Mm -hmm. And what's mm -hmm. happening is person one is acting, person two is interpreting that and giving mm -hmm. meaning to it, which That's may right. or may not be the meaning, which Absolutely. may or may not be the intention, but yeah. as it goes back in that triggering sense and how they respond is coming from their interpretation of the meeting, not whether or not that is accurate or true. Absolutely right. To what extent, as we were talking about earlier, those past clouds, right, have actually been triggered and activated. We know because it's so intense. And then their behavior, their action in the world today becomes based on their perception uh, rather than their, you know, an accurate representation of, of today. Yeah. Uh, and, and oh my gosh, I mean, intimate couples can create these uh, patterns and dynamics. There's usually one fundamental one in the relationship, but there can be multiple uh, patterns like this. And, you know, by the time they get, they get to me, uh, they have been going around this infinity loop forever and ever and ever and ever. Uh, and so it, uh, it takes some real um, willingness and, and focus uh, and attention to be able to shift out of these uh, dynamic patterns. Well, and I think one of the reasons why it, it takes effort is because we don't recognize the fact that it's habitual, yeah. you know, that like what happens is, you know, you raise your voice, I interpret that in a certain way. You raise your voice, I interpret that in a certain way. You raise your voice, I interpret that in a certain way. You raise the voice, I habitually respond before I even interpret that particular thing. That's and right. so if we fall into one of these patterns, these loops long enough, like it's no longer me processing. It's That's just right. responding. And for relationships that happen over a long period of time, you'll just see like this escalation happen over the course of a conversation or an interaction, not because of what's going on, and not even necessarily because of the history, but because of the habit that has been created out of the history where we're out of our mind. Like when I say out of my mind, I'm just like, I'm not conscious. I'm right. subconscious, unconscious in my response to that lower part of the brain. Because I think the thing that we, we don't think about is this is how I think I think. Yeah. The reality <laughs> is I think from the back of the brain to the front of my brain. And yeah. so I'm going from that unconscious, that subconscious before we even get to our executive function. Yeah. And so if I have a story, if I have a pattern, then I'm gonna get caught back in that infinity loop that you just shared with us because that's the history and that's the pattern that we that's have. The history, yeah. And I just wanna say it's all changeable. Like we were yes. saying before, right? These are just neural networks and we know that they're all changeable now. But what is so heartbreaking is that as couples, like, in my opinion, relationships are meant for us to heal, right? They're, mm. they're a gift. Yep. Right? And so this is the way that healing takes place. As I, I so I call it this um, potential love that hasn't yet had an opportunity to heal. So there's nothing wrong and bad about these dynamics. They're natural, they're normal. We all, uh, we all have them. Uh, some of us have, uh, willingness and and capacity and and resources to be able to address these things so uh, what is um how this ties into the whole biology is that as i said earlier our predominant imperative as biological beings is safety and only mm -hmm. when there's enough safety can we move into the growth and the expansion which is which is our birthright and so what is heartbreaking about this is the relationship then loses its security, loses its safety. Yeah. And in fact, the partner starts being seen as the uh, someone untrustworthy and a danger rather than someone who's safe and supportive. And, uh, and, and there's a way out is what I'm saying. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. B boy, are we complicated machines. Oh Holy my God. God. Have I got, <laughs> well, do I have time to share an example? Yeah. Quickly go ahead. Okay. So personal example. Um, I have this uh, son, he's 33 years old. L uh, last year, uh, son and, my, and his husband, my son-in-law, took me to uh, Italy for mm -hmm. a trip. And we're in Tuscany. So we'd been up at the top of Italy, we've been in Lake Como, we're traveling around, going to all these places. We are in a car, we arrive in Tuscany. It is hot, uh, it is just, I'm just in a miserable kind of a mood. Right. I will go up to my hotel room. It's hot. I don't think the air conditioning has been turned on. I'm really miserable. I complain to the hotel person. I am in a bad state. A hotel person doesn't help me. So I text son saying, please come and help me turn the air conditioning on. He comes. 
he looks at it, he says, I can't figure it out. And I say, I start to complain. It's like, wah, 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 wah. and he turns to me and he says, so uncharacteristically, he says, I can't figure it out and I don't have time to take care of it for you. Talk about triggering my vulnerabilities. Right. Right, all the shadows from the past where I felt so alone and so isolated and uncared for and unloved and all of those things, right? This is an important relationship. It all got triggered. And yeah. so this is, uh, this is what I knew to do. I was so intense with it, but I knew to step away from that relationship, to just say, okay, I'll see you later. Yep. Right? Call it the sacred space. Just step away from the relationship. And yep. number two, just start tapping. You don't yeah. know. You don't have to know a darn thing about it. Just start tapping. And just start tapping. And as I started tapping, then I started to cry. And I cried and I cried and I cried. And I just kept saying to myself, Nancy, keep crying until you're done. I'm yep. here with you, right? So really holding myself in that top pyramid of yep. compassion and self-care. And so I just it took probably about 20 minutes uh, to do that, to come back into uh, being present in the moment. Uh, and then uh, went down to the uh, the cocktail lounge where my son was waiting for me and was able then to bring the vulnerability and, and the transparency to say, hey, right. this is what happened to me, right? And then he was able to meet that energy and say, uh, yeah, and this is what was happening for me, mom. Right. And then he was able to reaffirm his, his love for me and, and so on and so on and so on. And I was so incredibly grateful. Uh, for EFT tapping in that moment, right? Because yeah. otherwise, I would have played that out. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. In a different and, way. And, and, yeah, yeah and, and, and more than likely, you know, a significant portion of his response was his resource state that he was in. Because yeah. international travel is hard, and a language that you don't yes, speak yeah. is hard. Like all of those things, like they just get, become compounding, and absolutely. all of a sudden, you know, like you know, the proverbial yeah. straw that breaks the camel's back. Like they're just to the yeah. point where, you know, like. Yeah, you're just like I'm done. I just I can't. Like yeah. you know, and and and, all, and unfortunately, you know, we don't always communicate that as kindly and as generously <laughs> yeah. as we'd like because we're stuck in our place as well. Yeah. Well, as you were saying, it's the context, right? Yeah. And so as I was able to sort of tap through my my stuff around it, it's like, okay, right now I get it. I understand the context. I understand he's been schlepping his mother around Italy for days here. Yep. That's <laughs> It's got to be stressful for him and and to come with that more uh, compassionate approach to the whole thing. Yep. Yeah. Awesome. So, well, sweet. Thanks, yeah. Nancy. This is like just such a it's like it's a simple framework, but I, mm -hmm. I think it's but I don't think we want to mistake for simple for unsophisticated or unuseful. Like, yeah, you know, like, like, like there's a difference between simple and easy and it's simple to understand the nature of relationships. That doesn't necessarily mean it's easy for us to be present, do the work, what's going on and recognizing it's about little daily things where we continue to rise the place that we are at, which makes it easier for us to recognize where we are so we can respond more effectively. Yeah, that's right. It's like that darn magic pill thing doesn't actually exist, does it? Right. Not yet. Yeah, five easy steps to flip your pyramid in less than That's 24 right. hours. We are not yeah. there. <laughs> awesome. That's great. Well, once again, Nancy, thank you so much for your time and your insight. Thank you, Gene. It's just always such a pleasure. Thank you for doing what you're doing here, too, on the 24-Hour Tapping Summit. Much appreciated. If you found this interview inspiring, I would encourage you to support the Peaceful Heart Network by going to 24hoursoftapping.com slash support or clicking the link in the description. And you will see on the screen right now a playlist to all of the interviews from this year's and last year's 24 hours of tapping. I hope you enjoyed those as well.